Good morning. Welcome to our online worship. We are glad that you could join us for worship this morning. As a call to worship, I want to read from Psalm 47, verses 1 and 2. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you for this morning that you have helped us to see. O oh God, as we worship you, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. O oh God, open our eyes to see thy glory. O oh Father God, please speak to us through thy word. I ask all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us praise the Lord by singing the song, Our God is Greater.
Let us all read responsively from Psalm 123 and 124. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of the master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of a mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God, till he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than enough of the scorn of those who are at peace, of the contempt of the proud. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to the teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Thank you. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for this day in which we can praise you, Lord. And when we listen to your word, oh Father, Lord, thank you for giving us your grace, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives and, Lord, all the provisions that you've given us, Lord. Lord, we pray especially for those who are suffering from COVID also, Lord. We pray for those who have been healed. We thank you, Lord, for that. We pray for those who have been hospitalized, Lord, that they might, Lord, have a quick recovery. And that, Lord, you might give them good health and strength, Lord. We pray for the youth of the church, oh Father, Lord, that you might help us, Lord. That we may be an example to others, Lord. And that we may, Lord, uh, follow you and be holy and pure, oh Father, Lord, and before your sight. Lord, please help us and preserve us from temptation. We pray, O oh Father, for those who are also of marriageable age, and Lord, for all the elders of our church, O oh Father, as they look for a suitable partner, we pray that, Lord, you might help them and guide us, O oh Father, Lord. We pray for those who are looking for jobs, and Lord, we pray for those who are studying as well, Lord. I pray that, Lord, you might give them, Lord, give good opportunities to them, and Lord, we help them in our stu studies as well, Lord. We pray for those Oh, Lord, above all, who are not born again, Lord, we pray that you might, Lord, give them your grace and, Lord, you might reveal themself, reveal yourself to them, Lord. Pray for the families in the church, of Father, that you might lead them, Lord, and spiritually, and, Lord, that you might meet all their needs, Lord. We pray for the children in the church. We pray, Lord, that you might keep, keep them safe from danger. And, Lord, uh, Lord, that one day they might, Lord, uh, come to fear, uh, knowledge and faith in you, oh, Lord. We pray for the elderly in the church, Lord, that my, you might lead them and guide them, give them good health and strength, Lord and uh, help them, strengthen them emotionally, physically, and spiritually, Lord. We pray that there may be fruitful, fruitful trees, Lord, in their old age. We pray for the unity of our church, and Lord, you might help us, Lord, to guard our lives and doctrine. We pray for the, the, those who are working in your field, Lord, who are working in your vineyard, we, Lord, that, may, that they will be able to divide your word, and Lord, that they may be able to build the church and build the people, Lord, with your strength. We pray, O oh Father, for those who are poor and those who are, Lord, uh, those who have uh, lost their jobs. Lord, we pray that you would help them, Lord, during this tough time. We pray, Lord, that you might be with them and uh, that they may not lose hearts, so Father, and may meet all their needs, Lord. We pray for our leaders and those who are in charge of our country. We pray, O oh Father, Lord, that you might give them good wisdom to govern our country and, Lord, to maintain peace and harmony, Lord, and to bring about screams, to bring about prosperity, Lord. We pray, help us and guide us, Lord, in during this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us as we sing the next song, Whom Shall I Fear? You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. Oh, 
stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the God of Praise the Lord. Uh, my name is Joanne and I am currently studying at ACS Medical College in Chennai. And uh, today I have, I thank God for this wonderful opportunity that he has given me to share my testimony. So, uh, I was born in a Christian family with two God-honoring parents and I had a brother. I have a brother. So, uh, we, we used to attend church regularly. We used to go to every event that was organized by the church and used to participate in everything quite uh, actively. So, so yeah, for, for my entire childhood, I was a, uh, we, we, we did all things religiously. But around my ninth to ninth uh, grade to eleventh grade, I had uh, I decided that I wanted nothing to do with Christianity or nothing to do with God. Uh, in itself and I, I wanted to pursue my own thing. I wanted to do my own thing and uh, do what was right in my own eyes and just go about doing as I wish. So uh, during my 9th and 11th standard, I, I like the prodigal son went out and was just enjoying the worldly pleasures as it presented itself. And then uh, during my uh, 12th grade, so after my 9th to 11th grade, uh, during my 12th grade, uh, one of my cousin brothers, so he he just came up and after our Sunday service, he just said, uh, Joanne, why don't you look up Christian apologetics? And uh, at first, I was quite skeptical about it. I, I I didn't want to particularly watch those long, lengthy videos, but uh, but then somehow I, I thought, okay, let's give it a shot. And I, I found myself within a few weeks watching these three hour long debates and all that stuff. And uh, like at the end of all, I, I used to come to a conclusion that, okay, so what I believe is irrational and what theism presents is quite rational. So uh, by the end of 2019, I, I came to this conclusion that theism was true, but still, I was not exposed to the gospel. I did not understand the gospel. So I just, during that period of time, I, I just maintain, I was trying to be a good person by my own efforts and maintain my image as a good person because if God existed, then I was morally accountable to him. Uh, but then after my board exams got over in March 2020, came April 2020 and the, there was nationwide lockdown. So during that time, uh, I, I just thought okay I, I picked up my bible and for some reason i decided to go through the book of romans and someone suggested me to take a commentary along with me so i found a online commentary by david gozik and uh, uh, every day i used to just take few four five verses and i used to read the commentary for it so uh, uh, so basically that was where i was coming across new terms like justification or maybe sanctification or propitiation or so, some terms like I had never heard before never I, like I was completely oblivious to these doctrines and then uh, as I went through the book that was where I first came to realize what the gospel was uh, uh, in Romans chapter 3 Paul says that there is none righteous no not one that's where I first understand that there is uh, no boast that I can have before God saying that I'm I'm a good person because there is none righteous there is none good but God alone and then he goes on with his argument in Romans 5 and he concludes it there and he says therefore having been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and that's where it was like like assembling a huge jigsaw puzzle like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle was suddenly starting to make sense 
and that's where i first started to understand what christ had done for his people how he had redeemed them how he was crushed under the wrath of god and he was that satisfying sacrifice to to extinguish the debt so uh, uh by the end of like 2 3 months uh, i found myself believing in christ alone for my salvation and from there on i found my life to bear tremendous fruits that i had never expected myself to be bearing uh, i went from a person who like had nothing to do with god wanted nothing to do with god to someone who wants to keep his law who wants to follow him and who wants to obey his commandments to to till the last breath and i thank god and it is all god's doing that he has brought about in my life and uh, and i know he has promised me that he'll take me home when it all comes to an end and uh, i thank god for all he has done in a, in my life and this small testimony of mine for the glory of god today's scripture reading is taken from exodus chapter 2 verses 1 to 10 now a man from the house of levi went and took as his wife a levite woman the woman conceived and bore a son and when she saw that he was a fine child she hid him 3 months when she could hide him no longer she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank and his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him now the daughter of pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant women and she took it when she opened it she saw the child and behold the baby was crying she took pity on him and said this is one of the hebrews children then his sister said to pharaoh's daughter Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, "Go." So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, "Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages." So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said. I drew him out of the water. Here ends the Bible reading. If you remember, we have been going through the first chapter, and I want to spe- be, uh, f- uh, you know, draw your attention to two things from the chapter one, namely that the people were under severe oppression. Uh, from a pharaoh who did not know who joseph was or who did not want to acknowledge him okay so that's where you find that the story ends in chapter 1 and also uh, y- you know th- th- there is this intense or rather uh, the multiplication of the people okay they were growing in numbers did that solve the problem of their oppression no in, in fact it made it worse now what is happening in chapter 2 is you know after focusing or rather you know giving us a distant view of what is happening the author now focuses us focuses on one family uh, or of what is happening in that family okay it was just another ordinary family there was nothing very spectacular about them they were part of the oppression uh, and uh, they were also part of the people who cried out to god the first you know principle that we can learn is god uses godly families to fulfill his purpose Now look at verse one. It says, "Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman." Woman. And so, you know, that's where he now focuses on one, one, one marriage, one couple, who both of them, the both the husband and the wife, are from the tribe of Levi. Who were they? What are their names? We are not. They are not mentioned here. but if you turn for a moment to numbers chapter 26 and verse 59 it says 
the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. And she bore to Amram Aaron and Moses and Miriam, their sister. So the father's name was Amram and the mother's name is Jochebed. What do we know about this couple? Not much. But there's something that is given in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23. It says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now that's a very unusual term to describe a boy baby. Okay? Uh, you normally don't use the word beautiful okay, for males. I mean, you can, but it's not a done thing. What does that word mean? Not just here, but turn to Acts chapter 7 and verse 20. At this time, Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. Now the injunction from Pharaoh was that they kill all the male children. It is against this backdrop that we need to understand what is happening, that they hid him for three months with much struggle because by this, by, all, by three months, after three months, you know, you cannot hide the fact that there is a baby in the house. Okay. I don't know what they did to make sure that they sound, you know, that the sound of the cry of the baby is not heard for three months, but they did something. But after three months, they found out they, they, they cannot hold it any longer. So what you find here is that they were bold enough to go for civil disobedience. Why? Simply because, as, as Hebrew says, by faith, Okay. when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful. So how do we understand the word beautiful? But before we look at that word beautiful, let me also say this, that this couple were grounded in faith. At the, sound of, at, at the risk of sounding too simplistic, let me mention this, that this is what life is all about. We are people of faith, nothing more, nothing less. Families with faith are instruments in God's hands. Who cares how big your house is or how much you draw as salary or what cars do you drive in? All that does not matter at all if I don't have faith. It's all about faith and faith alone. For those of us who are seeking life partners, remember that this must be a non-negotiable in your life. Don't fall into the trap of style and beauty and what not. You may be the neighbor's envy, but definitely not heaven's pride. Also, coming back to this question of beautiful, what is this beauty all about? After all, which parent will not think that the child is not beautiful? In Tamil, there's a saying, Ka kai ki tan kunji, pon kunji. Very true. So every parent, after all, would admire their children. So what's this beauty about? Also remember that it also says in Acts 7 that he was beautiful in not just parents' sight, but in God's sight as well. And therefore, there's more to it than what meets the eye. The word beauty in the original can be better translated as good. He was good. Remember, that this is part of the Torah, the law, which means that the story continues and the threads are picked up as, as the story unfolds. 
And so when the author introduces the word good there, he is picking up a theme that he already introduced in Genesis where in a chapter 1, namely that God saw that it was good. And so the word simply good there simply means it was a purposeful act of God. And so Jochebed and Amram knew that this child was not an ordinary child, but God's answer to the present predicament that they were in. How much they knew that he would do things uh, that we are not told, but they knew that this was God's answer to their problem. And so they hid because of faith. And also, I don't think that they thought, you know, they're kissing goodbye to their baby when they did that. They knew that something would happen. Because they knew that as much as God saw it was good in Genesis chapter 1, that's the same thing here. And therefore, the work of God cannot be stopped. Nobody can thwart God's plan. So coming back to this couple, godly families, they were not unequally yoked. They were, you know, people of faith. They were on the same page. Both of them. Not that they were on the same level of maturity, but they were on the same page when it comes to faith. Young people, may I say this to you? If you cannot find a per person of faith, don't marry. It will be better for you to remain single than to marry somebody who does not have faith because you will shipwreck your, your faith also if you do that. God's answer, God uses godly families to fulfill His purpose. They were not people of style and, and, and uh, fashion, but they knew God and they knew that God was working in their lives. The second thing that I want to place before you is the fact that God uses the normality of life's happening to do extraordinary things. He does miracles through the mundane. Somehow we can, you know, get bored with life. Boredom is the plague of our modern day. Everybody is bored. I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. Michael Jackson should have changed this song, not I'm bad, but I'm bored. Because that's a fact. But you see, it is the normality of life that, that God works many times. You know, always remember that you don't have to, God does not do miracles on a daily basis. If miracles happen on a daily basis, you cannot call them miracles, first of all. When he deems it necessary and how he sees it, sees it fit, he would do. But otherwise, the normalcy of life is used by God to fulfill his plan. So, verse 1, this, this very ordinary marriage that happened. No photo shoot. No uh, bridal shower, nothing of that sort. Just an ordinary simple wedding. But then also if you look at verse 2, it says, The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she, she hid him for three months. What's so unique about it? There's nothing unique about it. Everybody who gets married would, you know, Get, f find themselves, you know, having a baby sooner or later, unless God has other plans in their lives. You see, it is, but this is God's answer to their problem. At that time, nothing was visible. There was, there was fear in the hearts. Would we be found out? Would they kind of pin us down? But they had courage, not that they, they lost faith in, uh, in three months, that's not the point. But for the sake of the child, lest the you know, child is killed here, they thought, let's leave it to God. Also parents, remember, 
that if Moses and uh, I, I, I mean if Amram and Jochebed would leave their baby in a basket knowing that the creator of that baby will take care of that baby don't meddle with your children too much don't try to you know kind of hold the more you hold on to them when god removes them from your hand it will be painful watch out they are not yours they are firstly god's you have a responsibility to nurture the children till they reach you know they are they can stand independently and you need to progress towards the independence if you try to make them dependent forever you are doing something wrong and you will pay for it you know through your through your nose sooner or later the normalcy of life the mundane let me give you another example of this how god works through the mundane in in the book of esther you find that the king was one day having a sleeplessness he couldn't sleep okay and so what he did was i don't know you know how it works but he knew that studying history will put someone to sleep or reading history book no offense if you are doing history but the point is that this man this king asked for the you know historical uh, book of history and he asked you know somebody was reading for him all that happened it was then that they found out what mordecai had done i mean think of it how can this happen the the incident happened that the mordecai actually saved the king and uh, uh, you know nothing was done for him it was just you know uh, Uh, forgotten but the time came that through the sleeplessness of a king that god brings mordecai to the front and honors him normalcy of life don't get bored with routine normal is boring they say but not in heaven's perspective don't despise it thirdly you see don't despise or ignore children you look at that baby moses you you would not you know make anything big out of it what what's this just another child but you see god's answer to uh, god's answer both through the egyptian i mean the israelites who were in egypt and humanity which is in sin both of it is a baby the baby jesus and the baby moses okay very important this is not the way we think a helpless baby being the solution for a problem that is looms too large that you cannot solve on your own not even the entire community of people living in uh, egypt can solve the problem but god's answer was this small baby helpless baby turn with me for a moment to hebrews chapter 11 beginning from verse i mean 23 and 24 by faith moses when he was born was hidden for 3 months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict by faith Moses Moses when he was grown up refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter Now if you carefully follow that those two verses verse 23 speaks of Moses's parents faith whereas 24 speaks of Moses's faith Okay now to help us unlock this this two verses let me read for you it's from second timothy chapter 1 verse 5 it says this i am reminded of your sincere faith a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother lois and your mother eunice and now i'm sure dwells in you as well two examples of how faith is passed on it is not passed on through genes but it is passed on through instruction and nurturing very important 
that we got to do everything within your within our capacity to nurture the children in faith otherwise you are shipwrecking their entire lives what good will it gain for a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul your child can be an accomplished person but if he or she does not have faith they have lost in life don't despise or ignore them they can be a spear in your hands that, i mean they can be a arrow in your quiver that you can use to shoot where you want to shoot or they can be a spear that will plunge into your into your chest you can have heartaches and sleeplessness because you failed nurturing them in faith when it can be done it's not too late work at it let me read for you from the you know uh from the covenant that we use during child uh, you know in uh, dedication of a child okay uh, i will read the you know the entire thing i mean this one part of it and also the response of the parents okay and i quote from that scripture commands you as parents to teach your child about the lord jesus only then he or she will be adequately equipped for the challenges of life and sufficiently prepared to meet the lord when he returns but your child's spiritual welfare will not be accomplished simply by telling him about jesus it is the words of your mouth combined with the obvious presence of the holy spirit in your life that will effectively communicate the message of god's love and saving power to your child the birth of your son and daughter or daughter needs to inspire within both of you a greater resolve to let christ shine through you by being even more intentional in the pursuit of your holiness and the supremacy of god in your home so and so what is your response and the parents will say we will by god's help this is no fun this is serious stuff because either i will be a bridge on which the child will walk to jesus christ or i will become a stumbling block for them o unto me if i am a stumbling block if you married and both of you know the lord jesus christ as your savior don't kill your 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 children spiritually with your squabbles and fight if you if you're married and one of you know christ and the other person does not or he or she is not in a in in the same level of your maturity the one who's mature needs to demonstrate his or her maturity by trading off many things i can tell you one thing no one has lost out in life because he did it for god or she did it for god if you're waiting to get married consider the cost and train yourself in sacrifice otherwise you 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 you'll be fighting a losing battle fourthly god uses obedience of ordinary people to fulfill his plan now notice verse 3 when she could hide him no longer she took him a she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank how can we interpret this as obedience because i said that god uses obedience of ordinary people where do you see obedience here remember the genesis connection okay now the word basket 
that is used in Exodus chapter 2, 3 is the same word that is used for Noah's ark. Okay? Which means that, you know, God instructed Noah to build an ark for you and your family. And same, same word is used here. That, this means that you got to interpret this from the light of Noah's incident, namely that it was she was obeying God when she did this. She could have turned the baby up in, 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 uh, in uh, you know, the, throw the baby in the Nile actually. Sorry, yeah, throw the baby in the Nile. But she did not throw the baby into the Nile. But she put a, made a basket which is, re, uh, which is uh, replicating what happened. Not that you can replicate everything that God did in the past, but here it is that way. The obedience of ordinary people. Fifthly, God uses women in the saga of deliverance. Okay? Remember in chapter 1, we saw two women, Shipra and Pua. They also went for civil disobedience against the Pharaoh's edict because they feared God. So what can we learn from Shipra and Pua that, you know, it doesn't matter you know, whether we are male or female, we can be used by God when we fear God and obey Him. So you see Shipra and Puva there. Here in this chapter, we see Moses' mother, Jochebed, okay, who again went for civil disobedience against the, against the Pharaoh's edict. But what is fascinating about Jochebed is the wisdom with which she operated. Where, how do I say wisdom? Now, if you notice verse 3, okay, it says, when she, could, when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket and made of bulrushes and daubed it with pit bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. You can be sure if you ask any mother, how would you feel if you had to do this? Every mother would say, my heart will blow up into pieces if I do something like that. And Jochebed was no different. But you see, what is fascinating is, when she was going through this extreme grief of going to be separated from her child, her wisdom is just outlandish. I will tell you why. Okay. Because it says that she placed it among the reeds. What's the implication? That the, that the basket would not be drawn with the water current. It will remain there. Chances of somebody finding it is high. Okay, Only a woman can come up with something so wise as this. But still, they're not called to preach. That's, none, that's not the domain in which God, God uses them. In his own way. So, Jochebed is, is definitely uh, a brilliant lady. Also, know that, you know, if the basket was, you know, went with the current, Nile is a place where crocodiles would, uh, you know, be in plenty. There's also that danger. But against all odds, God protected the child. The fourth, you know, woman that I want to place before you is this little girl called Miriam. Miriam, for Miriam also it was quite, a heart would have been heavy to, to see her baby boy, baby brother, you know, being left in the Nile. But she, what she did is, she stood there, she didn't initiate this, but it was Pharaoh's daughter who initiated it. When she initiated it, Miriam latched onto it and said, can I go get you a, a, a nurse for her? They call her wet nurse. 
that's exactly what it's all about when it's not your own child but you are breastfeeding the ch the child for somebody else they call that you know wet nurse and so that's what she was doing that's what miriam is offering i'm 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 again appalled at her wisdom of the little baby not that she was instructed by her mother for this she impulsively did it okay isn't it amazing that even little children can possess so much wisdom because god has endowed them with wisdom the fifth woman that i want to place before you is pharaoh's daughter her da her dad was a cruel man he's a beastly man really but from this man i mean this man's daughter look at verse 6 it says when she opened it she saw the child and behold the baby was crying she took pity on him and said this is one of the hebrews children she didn't mistake that this child was a egyptian child she pre precisely knew that this was an egypt uh, 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 you know jewish child but notice that her compassion in compassion she reaches out isn't it amazing that the father was a ruthless man but the daughter was a compassionate girl or lady and this one was the one who was instrumental in delivering the baby who will deliver the israelites okay sixthly god's ways are out of the world why do i say that look at verse 9 seven to 9 then his sister said to pharaoh's daughter shall i go and call you a nurse for the hebrew woman to nurse the child for you and pharaoh's daughter said to her go so the child girl went and called the child's mother and pharaoh's daughter said to her take this child away and nurse him for me and i will give you your wages so the woman took the child and nursed him i don't think uh, miriam was expecting any remuneration for from pharaoh's daughter she was just interested in saving her baby brother but what is fascinating is again god's plan to bring up moses under royal protection under royal funding how do you like that um you know moses was brought up was nurtured in the place which actually stood against the israelites okay it was the headquarter nobody can come up with any plan like this god's plans are always out of the world wait for god's plan to fulfill boys commenting on this says and i quote when you run away from the lord is quoting up and talking about jonah when you're running away from the lord you will never get to where you are going and you always pay your own fare but when you go the lord's way you always get to where you are going and he pays the fare jonah never got a refund for the unused part of his journey but this lady was paid for bringing up her own child Pharaoh's plan was extermination of Israelites but God was using his plan for the emancipation of Israelites Pharaoh's extermination was God's emancipation plan Seventhly and lastly God charters our course It says when verse 10 when the child grew older she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and became her son she named him Moses because she said I drew him out of the water Now Moses being saved by Pharaoh's daughter should either be called as chance or providence 
If you believe in chance, then your faith is too great. I would rather believe in a God who charters our course than chance. You see, God, the steps of a good man are ordered by God. Okay, so now in, uh, we'll just look at one verse that we will again be seeing next week. Look at verse 11. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Now, what is happening is that for a, we do not know till uh, when was Moses with Jochebed and when did he actually move into Pharaoh's house. But it will be safe to conclude that it would have happened somewhere around 12 or maybe before. Not a big deal about, you know, at what age. Because uh, 12 is the age uh, they call, you know, when, when a person, fin when a Jewish boy finishes 12, they call it Bar Mitzvah. Because by that time, he is nurtured in faith. This, of course, was a much later development. But, uh, you know, somewhere between 10 to 12. But what had happened is, uh, Moses was trained in his faith by his parents. And then he goes to the, uh, to, uh, Pharaoh's uh, pal to the palace and there he was trained in administration, in war and in management and all that. You see, God was training him. God was taking him through a course. That's why he said, God charters our course and decides the time as well. Okay. In closing, let me say this. You see, we don't see any mention of the word God Okay, in this chapter, or at least from verses 1 to 10. Okay, there's no mention of the word God. But God was acting, as I said, through the normality of, of events, through the mundane. We see his wisdom, his protection, his providence, and what not. Don't ignore the mundane, for God can and does miracles through the mundane. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time of Lord meditation. God, we truly thank you for your wisdom and your sovereign plan, Lord. The Lord, we know that none of us can even think of anything like this. Lord, how often we get bored with our routine. Father, help us to remember the sacredness of life and the sacredness of our responsibilities, whether at school, at other places of study, or at our work, or at home. May we remember the sacredness of what we do. Lord, as Paul says, help us to do it all for the glory of God. May we not fall into the trap of boredom, but help us to find joy in doing the mundane, O Master. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
His mercy seat Thou didst to Him Thine all commit He gave Thee war And from that heart To trust His wisdom Love and power Did ever trouble yet before Father, we thank you, Lord, for even as we sang that you would make amends for all. Lord, we know that nothing of what, Lord, we seem to lose in this world would actually be lost for the reward that we will, ex that we will receive, Lord, from you is not worth being compared to what we are giving up in this world. And Lord, like Moses, help us to sacrifice the fleeting pleasures of this world for the sake of suffering or bearing the reproach of Christ. We thank you once again, Lord, for this time of worship. As we go from here, send us with your blessings. For this we ask of Jesus' name. Amen. The peace of God that passeth all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.